We're going to spend most of our time today in the book of Daniel. So we'll let you find Daniel chapter 9. If you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we're using a scripture in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, kind of as our guide, and then we're going back and finding some of the scriptures that are being referenced. So let me read that passage first. You keep your place in Daniel, because that's where I'm going next. But in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, and then by the Twelve. Those Scriptures that reference that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we've been going back over, reminding ourselves about them. So we will be in Daniel to get started. When we first started this little review, and of course this is leading up to Resurrection Sunday, we began in the book of Exodus, studied Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, discovered everything that happened to that lamb a picture of what would happen to Jesus. So we discover the day that he entered into uh, Jerusalem, that would have been the same day that the lamb, national lamb was set aside. That would be the 10th of Nisan. We discovered the day on which Jesus would die. And that would be Passover, Nisan, the 14th of Nisan. And then we discovered the day that Jesus Jesus arose according to the scriptures and that was the the feast of, uh, of first fruits which is a day within the feast of unleavened bread that would be the 17th of Nisan and so it had to be according to the scriptures we find out which particular day in the year that he set aside and that he dies and that he rises again we went then to Isaiah uh, end of chapter 52 and all of chapter 53 uh, some of the things that he would have to fulfill, uh, part of his job description, part of uh, the scourgings and all that he went through, part of uh, the way he responded to his trials, that uh, he would not defend himself. And we went into a lot of details there. And all of those scriptures are literally fulfilled in Christ. We went uh, last week to Psalm 22 because Jesus draws our attention to that. He quotes Psalm 22, 1, and then he quotes the very end of the psalm. So we spent both morning and evening in Psalm uh, 22. Some of the things he was feeling, what was going on around the cross, uh, David describing crucifixion uh, before it had ever been dreamed up, before the Romans ever came up with that way of executing their criminals. Today, uh, we go to uh, about the time in history that this is going to happen. And that was shown to Daniel. So that's what we're looking at today. Uh, about when did this take place? We've already got the days of the year that are specifically there. What's going on in the heart of Christ? What's going on around him? Uh, the, the, the events that took place and all of this was literally fulfilled. And here we're going to have a time frame that this is going to take place. So we're in Daniel chapter 9. We will be in Daniel chapter 9. And it says this. 
In the first year of Darius, the son of Aesurus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said, O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, we have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, to our fathers and all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand the truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. Verse 16, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the one who has taught us as part of our gathering together, as we come together in your presence, we are to include the reading aloud of your word. And Lord, we acknowledge Psalms is your word, 1 Corinthians is your word, Daniel is your word. Lord, we are doing what you've taught us to do. What is on your heart? What are you saying to us? We ask that you would apply the word that we are considering to each of us. 
show us, Lord, what you're saying. What are your guidance? What is your guidance? What is your direction? What is your heart for us today? And Lord, once we know your will, we ask for power by your Holy Spirit to do what you say. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God had shared many things with Daniel at this point in his walk with the Lord. Daniel is now serving the Persians who had come and had conquered the Babylonians. Uh, Daniel had been a part of this for 70 years uh, and he knew that things were beginning to get close to when God wanted to send a portion of his people back that there would be a remnant and that there would be a rebuilding he discovered this through the study of God's Word and specifically the Holy Spirit wants us to know that he was studying what we call the book of Jeremiah and as he uh, studied that uh, he discovered in Jeremiah what we would call Jeremiah 25 that God not only purposed this judgment but he purposed a return and so God had been telling the truth in the judgment and everything that was prophesied through Jeremiah literally came to pass Daniel had lived it and now he sees there is a promise that after 70 years of desolation it was God's heart that his people come back and so he began to set himself uh, to seek God's will how does that work out Daniel discovered the will of God by studying the Word of God you've probably experienced that I hope you've experienced that and I hope you will experience it many more times you know God's will is revealed in his word and what you and I know about God is by revelation we're not smart enough to figure out God on our own he has to reveal himself to us he has to give us revelation and then by faith we accept that and we know who he is and what he's doing and, and what his character is all about we do not know the ways of God except through the Word of God uh, how do we discern if something is of God or not unless we screen it through the scriptures as followers of Christ we are commanded to prove all things hold fast that which is good as followers of Christ we are commanded to test the spirits to see if they are of God or not how do you do that you screen it through God's Word God will never contradict himself the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit will never contradict the Holy Spirit and so there is always agreement uh, from in God's will and God's Word Daniel understood this uh, he was a giant when it came to faith uh, when it came to his relationship with the Lord even in his generation it had been revealed that God listed him in, in the same group as Job and as Noah and that's something to be known in your own generation as a person of faith to that level uh, he was a great man of faith God had done miraculous things in and through him up to this point some of the things that God had shared with him overwhelmed him uh, there is a time difference between Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 but when you uh, you see a vision that Daniel was was given and uh, what was coming remember Daniel's the one who gets to see and and gets the details on the the uh, empires of men that will rule the the world starting with the Babylonian Empire and then the Medes and the Persians and then the Greeks and uh, then the Romans and then a, an empire of men that is short-lived but shortly before the coming of the Messiah uh, out of the old Roman Empire that and he got to see that uh, group that would be there and who the leader would be and some of the things that would take place and he said that when God showed him stuff like that it just overwhelmed 
overwhelmed him. He couldn't handle it. He was mighty in spirit. He was mighty in faith. But when God chose to share some of those things overwhelmed, God chooses to share those things with us. Do you understand that, that the visions that Daniel saw are recorded and you get to see them? And very often it can be very overwhelming. The eighth chapter ended with these words in Daniel uh, chapter 8 verse 27 says and I Daniel fainted and was sick for days afterward I arose and went about the king's business I was astonished by the vision but no one understood it and there's a time gap between the eighth chapter and the ninth chapter but here we have Daniel not giving up some things God showed him and he knew it was the Lord, but he didn't know exactly what to do with it. But he was very faithful to record it and to proclaim it exactly as God had revealed it. Here in the ninth chapter, it's included this prophecy of the, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel. All that we have read so far is the lead. Here's where Daniel was at spiritually. He was at a certain place in his walk with the Lord because of what he discovered in Bible study in the book of Jeremiah. And once he knew the heart of God, once he knew the will of God, he began to line his life up with God. He began to line his prayers up with God's prayers and his will with God's will. And he began to pray and he began to do that which scripture taught him. What would be the spiritual conditions necessary for the will of God to move forward, for this 70 years to be wrapped up and for a remnant to be allowed to go back? What was necessary? And he discovered that the purpose of God's judgment was to draw the nation back to himself. That as a nation, and this was the southern kingdom of Judah, because 150 years previous, the northern kingdom of Israel had been swept away by the Assyrians. Syrian Empire. And so what had happened now, the southern kingdom of Judah, which lasted about three generations longer than the northern kingdom, they are now swept away by the Babylonians. The Babylonians came through in three waves. There were three invasions over 14 years. And uh, Daniel was taken in the very first group that went. Ezekiel was part of that uh, second group uh, that was taken. But then there was a third and final where the city was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and there was just, there was just a horrible slaughter. And so uh, he didn't know exactly what's, what's the starting point. Which one of those invasions uh, is, is spoken of with Jeremiah? But he discovered the purpose of those invasions was to discipline the southern kingdom of Judah that they might repent as a people, come back into covenant with God, that God might do a work in them so that through them he could touch all the nations on the earth. And that's why even though we are not Jewish, you and I study a lot of Jewish history and scripture because God God says, if you are my people, if you are born again, if you're in covenant with me, there are some spiritual lessons to be learned. And I'm going to share them with you. And I'm going to plant them in my scriptures. And include, as you study the scriptures, an open heart, a prayerful heart, because I'm going to teach you some things. You know, you and I, if you can combine Bible study with your prayer time, and I promise you just a little bit of God's word goes a long way. But if you can share your heart, heart with the Lord. You just pour out your heart unto the Lord and then you let God speak to you out of his word and then you share your heart and let God speak to you out of his word and he'll, he'll, he'll take you to various places. You know, you may, the Holy Spirit will have you here and then the Holy Spirit will have you back there, but he'll kind of trace God's thought right through scripture so that you hear clearly, you know, and, and you become convinced of God's will and what God is saying to you and what's the next step to take in the, your walk with the Lord. Because as God's people, uh, part of the promise is we are his sheep and uh, we know his voice. Jesus is the good shepherd and those who are saved know the voice of Jesus Christ. And so that's part of, our, of, the, of the blessing, of the benefit of being born again in Christ. 
we know that we will never hear anything in the spirit that is contrary to what is written and therefore you always go to the word if you believe you're hearing from God if you believe that's the voice of God you will find that confirmation in scripture if you cannot if there is no scripture then there is no truth and you don't want to be led astray you always want to have that confirmation not only the leading of the spirit but the confirmation of the word truth is confirmed by two or more witnesses Daniel understands that what God's goal was was not to make life miserable for people but to restore the nation and he began to review the history of the nation since he had been alive and he says everything that God prophesied has happened but I see what God requires and it's not happened yet what has not happened as a people we have not repented as a people we have not turned from our sins we've just kind of endured hardship and we've endured judgment and we're hanging in there uh, and we're trying not you know not to give up but we have not humbled ourselves before God we have not stood upon his word we have not confessed our national sins we have not thrown ourselves on the mercy of God and so da uh, Daniel said that that's what I will do I will do that I can't get anybody else to do that I can't change anybody else's heart but Lord you've made it clear to me I'm a member of this nation I served you high up in, in, the, in Babylon now I'm serving you high up in the Persian Empire but I understand that you are my God and so he humbles himself and he puts on sackcloth and ashes and he goes into fasting and he gets to a particular place where God gives him a certain prayer. And when he prays it, God says, record it. Because my people need to hear that prayer. My, I honor this kind of praying. This will always work in every generation. And so you'll see what we read, and I know it's quite a prayer, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it takes you a little while to read the prayer. When God starts recording prayers verbatim, and he says, my people in every generation need to be taught this prayer. They need to know this prayer. They need to be able to apply it in their generation. Because there are spiritual principles which are the same from generation to generation. So when we started this, and he started praying that Daniel 9 verse 3 says, then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting sackcloth and ashes and I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession and said now we're not going to read that whole thing again but that's why we read it you know all the way through his prayer and you will notice that he quoted the word and he says you were right in what you did we find no fault in what you did you gave us a warning that if we kept falling into idolatry and we kept hardening in our hearts and we kept doing things our way that you told us exactly what would happen and you were right Lord you were right in what happened it has been exactly as you said and it is not your fault it is our fault in verse 8, we read, O Lord, to us belong shame and of face to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have <clears throat> sinned against you. As he continued to identify with these people, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There are no sins recorded against Daniel in Scripture kind of one of those unusual situations there's only a few people if we know something about them that there's not some sin recorded but there are no sins recorded against them and yet what is recorded Daniel says I am a sinner and I'm part of this sinful nation and I'm as much to blame as anybody who's come before me or anybody who's alive today and he says Lord hear your servant you have my attention he didn't know if God was getting a hold of anybody else out there. But God got a hold of him. And if nobody else confessed national sin and their own sins, he would and he did. If nobody else stood on the word of God, he did and he would continue. If nobody else called to mercy, uh, to memory the mercy and grace of God, 
he would. Do you understand his purpose? Look in verse 18. He says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations, and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. He says, Lord, I'm not here to say we have earned mercy. I am not here to say that we have earned grace. I am here to stand upon your promise that if we acknowledge our sins and we humble ourselves and we cry out to you, you will be there. And so standing upon the grace of God, he gets so far into this prayer and God shows up in a way he cannot imagine. God over answered his prayer. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You're praying about one thing and God mentions it briefly and then all of a sudden God just opens up a whole nother area of his kingdom. I mean, God starts to talk to you about things that, that you'd never even thought of. And here's how it happens. In Daniel 9, 20, it says, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, and he's, we're talking about an archangel here, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning. Gabriel had been present before God had sent him before with answers being caused to fly swiftly reach me about the time of the evening offering and the evening offering is about three in the afternoon in fact it was set at three when they went to the 24 hour clock later with the Romans that seems a little early for evening but remember by the time they switch to the 24 hour clock the day starts at six in the evening the day starts our evening okay it's a very different way of telling time remember we always want to use bible time and bible dates and bible calendar when we study the word of god we don't want to try and figure all this out through an american calendar or our current time we always want to use what the scripture uses He's, so about the time that they would be having nationally the evening offering unto the Lord, because there's always a morning offering, there's always an evening offering. He says, at that time, Gabriel shows up and he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and seventy-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary." Now, let's just stop. We're not going to get too much further, and we'll have to finish this this evening. But we need to get to a certain part to make sure we apply it to 1 Corinthians 15. Gabriel shows up with God's answer. In other words, he lets him know God's listening. He not only gives him assurance that it's there, there's going to come a time to go back. But then he starts talking about things he had never considered. Things he had never thought about. And God says, I need to tell you some things. You've never thought about these things. But they're important. This is what I'm doing. You want to know my heart. Let me share this with you. I hope you've discovered that in prayer and Bible study too. 
stuff you've never thought about, stuff that wasn't important to you, stuff you didn't even know you needed to know, all of a sudden God gives you revelation in the scriptures <laughs> and you're a part of a ministry or doing something that you had never even considered, you had never even heard of. Because see, God knows you best. He knows the calling that's on your life. He knows the gifting that he has poured into you. He knows the generation that you are a part of. And he knows uh, that you desire to be fruitful and effective in his service. So we have Daniel getting his prayer over answered. And he gets a vision of 77s, translated as weeks here. And the word is heptad. And heptad just means seven. And it's not a particular number. It it's, represents a number. If I say dozen, oh, that's 12. Is dozen a number? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's not, you don't write it as a number, but that dozen means 12. Score. Oh, that's 20. Well, a heptad is seven. And that's why it's translated as weeks. Why? Because there's seven. <laughs> it's a seven. That's how they chose to, to translate it. So we have literally 77s. There's 490 of something. And I'll tell you that uh, in the interpretation, this is 490 years. And he says, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you when it starts. And I'm going to tell you what happens at the 49-year period. And then I'm going to tell you what happens at the 483-year period. And then I'm going to tell you what happens at 490 years. Now, these 490 years are not all together. There's still seven years that are on this particular vision, and that's why a lot of people have heard about it. And that's why there's some knockdown, drag out fights over it. Boy, there's some people who just get mad at each other on the way. What we're interested in is does Daniel tell us when the Messiah will be on the earth and he will die? And he does. And I'm not quoting a particular day and year. I'm talking about a season. But what he says, when this is all over with, it's all going to be over with, everything that's listed in verse 24 is going to take place. Well, that's why there's still seven years that are left on this particular vision. But he says, know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, and that's Jesus, there should be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So there's 69 weeks, 69 sevens altogether. So it's 483, 483 years. It says the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. After the 62 weeks, in other words, at the end of the 483 years, Messiah shall be cut off. In other words, he will die, but not for himself. Not because he had done anything wrong. And that's in keeping, isn't it? Jesus didn't die for himself. Jesus died a vicarious death. He died in place of the sinner. He died to pay the price for all of mankind's sins. He died to meet the holy demands of God. He died to fulfill uh, the law. It says, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We had to get to that portion of God's answer to his prayer because we're looking for those scriptures. Remember, Jesus has to, he has to die according to the scriptures. He has to be buried according to the scriptures. And he has to rise again according to the scriptures. Well, this gives us the time in history that this is going to happen. So if you can find the, the time to rebuild the order going forth, 483 years after that, the Messiah has to be present. Well, that took place a long time ago. I mean, a long time ago. We're talking well over 2,000 years ago that that took place. I once heard a brother in the Lord who was a rabbi who got saved and, and God kept him to minister among the Jewish population. He became a rabbi of a Messianic Jewish congregation. So he used his training plus what God shared with him beyond then in the New Covenant. And he said the thing that really got his attention 
even though he had been told that Jesus of Nazareth could not be the one they were waiting for, the more he studied, he says this was something that he could not escape. Daniel was a true prophet, and Daniel said from this particular point, 483 years later, the Messiah will be present, and then he will die, but not for anything that he has done. He said he could not escape that, no matter, and so he began to dig, and he began to seek the Lord, and he discovered that, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. And so he humbled himself, and he cried out. He was born again, and God continued on. He was a rabbi, but now in a messianic congregation, no longer being able to serve the congregation because when he shared his experience, he was invited to leave. And so he continued on for those others who had discovered that same truth, that yes, Jesus Christ is the one whom the prophets foretold, that he is the one. And if you have a Jewish background or a Gentile background, you must be born again. You have to admit that you're a sinner sinner and you turn from your sin and turn to Christ you humble yourself and you cry out for mercy and Jesus will be right there this happened a long time ago we're we're talking about and it ends on the day that Jesus dies and so it's important to know when it starts and then when it finished and that's as far as we're going to get today this morning we'll finish this chapter tonight let's pray Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for your openness and your honesty to us. And Lord, again and again and again, as you give prophecies, we see that you literally fulfill them in that first coming of Christ. We also, Lord, are aware of many prophecies that are to be fulfilled in the second coming of Christ. Lord, because you got it right the first time, we believe you'll get it right the second time. So Lord, as we are searching and as we are doing our best to reach out to neighbors and friends and family, Lord, help us to always be able to speak your word and to speak the truth in love. And Father, we're counting on you to touch those that are on our heart that we're witnessing to about you, especially at this time of year. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.